Here we start the real meat of today's presentation. We're going to take everything that we've covered so far and we're going to start combining the parts and pieces to produce rigorous decision systems. It's very, very important that you do this and, and, and take this type of approach because it takes the emotions out of trading. Too many people are fall victim to their own emotions. They, there's a company that they love and they just want to buy it. So they keep on buying into the lows as, as it's making new lows, thinking that each one is a non-confirmed new low and a buying opportunity. By taking this type of approach, by taking a rigorous approach, you'll be able to identify what the real buying opportunity is and miss the problems along the way. Likewise, if people aren't comfortable with their systems and, and they don't believe that the systems are rigorous and working according to first principles, they won't be able to execute them. They won't be able to take the buys when they come. They'll get shaken out of the trades. Everything that we're doing today is to try to increase your confidence in your process so that you have greater confidence in the decisions you make and you're able to stick with them and profit with them. It's very easy to get shaken out of a trade, but if you have a good system and a nice set of decision rules to accompany it, then you will not be falling victim to the, your emotions as often as you would otherwise. There's no way to eliminate your emotions from the process completely, but this goes a long way towards helping you do so. Um, we're going to start in this session, we're going to start with a trend following system. After lunch, we're going to come back and we're going to look at a system that attempts to buy highs and lows. So this is a go with the flow type approach and the other will be a reversal type of approach. So trend following systems, go with the flow, go with what's happening. We're not trying to pick bottoms, we're not trying to pick tops. We're trying to identify ongoing trends and participate in them. We buy strength and we sell weakness. Volume confirmation is an important part of this puzzle. Real strength in the market, real weakness in the market is confirmed by volume. People are coming in <coughs> aggressively and moving stock prices. The way you get a handle on that is via the volume clip. Indicators must confirm price action. Otherwise, you're out there in the intuitive, soft, touchy-feely world, and you fall victim to your fear and to your greed, and you'll stay too long, get out too early, bust trades that otherwise would have been good trades. It's very problematic. Here is our example trend following system set out in English. Um, we want price to be near the upper band or near the lower band. If it's near the upper band, percent B will be greater than 0.8, right? Or 80%. If it, we're near the lower band, percent B will be below. Point two. Right? So we're, we're eliminating the middle 60% of the band and we're only interested in the area near the bottom band and the area near the upper band. Outside of the bands is okay too, but we want to be at least in the bottom 20% of the band or the upper 20% of the band or beyond. For indicator confirmation, we're going to use the money flow index, and our rule is going to be the money flow index has to be greater than 80 when percent B is greater than 0.8, or for a sell, the money flow index has to be less than 20 when percent B is less than 0.2. So we're looking for the twin conditions. For strength, we're looking to be in the upper section of the band with a very strong indicator in the upper section of its normalized area, 0 to 100. For weakness, we're looking to be in the bottom portion of the bands. 
and we're looking for a very weak indicator in the lower 20% of its normalized range. Tweaks. I know that no one in this room is going to go out and deploy them the way I present them. That, as we've spoken about before, is a very good thing. You're going to tailor this to suit your own purposes. Well, here's some ideas as to how you can tweak some of these things, some directions that I think will be interesting for you to explore. You may require a bit less strength or a bit less weakness. So you may back percent B off to 70% or 30%, but if you do, then you can ask for even stronger indicator confirmation or even weaker indicator confirmation. What you're trying to do here is get in a little bit earlier. You're trying to say, I want to get in as we're lifting off a little bit earlier, but only when that liftoff is accompanied by really solid indicator strength. Likewise, I want to sell a little bit earlier in the process. Instead of waiting to get down to point two, I'll, I can sell maybe at point three or point two five, something like that, but I'm going to require that my indicator be even worse. Now, if we were using intraday intensity percent as an indicator, maybe we would say, that intraday intensity percent had to be less than minus 25, or intraday intensity percent had to be greater than plus 25. It's the same idea. It's just a different indicator, but the logic is the same. What we're looking for is price strength that is confirmed or led by indicator action. The, the idea behind volume indicators uh, it is a very clear idea. It's a handle on, on trying to get at, at, the, at the market's accumulation distribution, supply, demand equation. You're trying to find out what's going on behind the scenes. And the, the first principle behind all volume indicators is, is a very simple first principle. It's that volume precedes price. After you've made a long low, a big low in a stock, and you started to build a base, the idea is that volume will start to come in on the upside as people start to accumulate the stock in anticipation of the coming advance. So volume precedes price. So that's why the tweaks are skewed in this direction. They're skewed in favor of the indicator, not price, because we believe that these volume indicators have leading characteristics to some extent. So if you're going to do these tweaks, I think the tweaks should favor the indicators rather than favoring the price structure. Here's an example. Trend system, trend following system by example. We'll come down. We're trading sideways here. We come down. We tag the lower band. We reverse. We come back up and immediately tag the upper band, that already tells you that there's some strength brewing. We're strong enough now to get up to the upper band and tag it. So we're no longer confined in a primary downtrend where we're bouncing along the, the lower band. So it's kind of like our alert. We've been able to swing from the lower band to the upper band. We're taking a look around and seeing if our criteria are going to be met. So here's our money flow index. And here is percent B. So when percent B is greater than 80 and the money flow index is 80 or greater, bang -o. There's our buy signal. And it occurs right here. And you just start a nice big walk up the upper band. So that's the mechanics. We're looking to buy emerging strength from a stock. It's a very simple approach, but it's a very robust approach because it's based on first principles. Now, how do you know if you have a robust approach? Some of you are going to go home and are going to deploy these systems. How can you test to determine whether they're robust? Vary your parameters and watch your results. For instance, this is 80 and 20. 
So test it with 85 and 15 and test it with 75 and 25. Get a, a couple of different parameter sets and check to see that your results don't change much. They're going to change. There's no question about that. What you want is a condition called insensitivity to small changes. The reverse is what characterizes chaotic systems. They have great sensitivity to small changes. That's the opposite of what you want in a trading system. What you want is insensitivity to small changes. Change your parameters by little bits hither and thither, test across a number of securities, and your win-loss ratios and your, um, your percentage of winners versus losers should stay more or less the same. Not identical, they're never going to stay identical, but you should stay in the same ballpark. If that's not true, then the combination that you've chosen isn't a robust combination, and you shouldn't deploy that because small changes in the market structure, small changes in the environment can have big effects on your trading system. This is an incredibly important principle. Insensitivity to small changes equals robust trading systems. It's very, very important. Here's the reverse. Here's a sell. If we saw more here, I bet you that this is three pushes to a high. There's a little one, two, three here with a big deterioration in the indicator um, occurring right here. Notice that when you come back up to retest here, the indicator is at a much lower level. See, here's the day you come up to retest. The indicator here is at a much lower level than the last time you were up trying to probe this price structure. So you already have some hint that there's some disturbance going on here, that things aren't as good as it should be. So we're going to use our system to enter the cell. Here we go. We get, a, um, we get a down day here. It's right here is the entry. You've had one, two, three, four, five, six down days in a row. Pretty ominous, generally. On this day right here, MFI falls below 20, and percent B falls below 20. The next day, you gap down, and MFI goes even further, and percent B turns negative. That is, we actually make it out of the lower band, and then you just get a waterfall decline. Look at this. If you draw this line through here, it's not perfect, but you get a little throwback rally. So if you miss the original entry system, we talked about throwback rallies a lot yesterday. Here's your little throwback rally. Don't quite get there, but it gives you a re-entry opportunity, especially since the price destruction is really deteriorating here. The indicator is running relatively negative. The throwback rally just brings MFI back to neutral 50. There's the line from the formation. You break down. You get a little rally back towards it. You know, on this day when you turn back down, that's as great a re-entry system. Lady here talked yesterday about adding two positions. What a great place to add to a position. You know, to say, this is a terrible place to add to a position late in the process. But early in the process, when everything's working for you, is a great place to add to a position. You know, this system is good as an alert also. Um, because what will happen is sometimes as it's getting ready to go, it'll almost trigger a signal two or three times, and then you'll get the signal. So when you get a signal that's almost there, but not quite, tag it as an alert in your mind. Even if it's not, even if it's not a signal, just say, oh yeah, something's happening there. I want to come back and look at that chart again in, the, in, in coming periods. And um, so what you get here, look, on this case, we got a percent B above 1. Um, and then uh, we got a little, a little peak near 70 in MFI. It's kind of an alert. Um, here again, we get, uh, um, we get almost to 80 here, and we get percent B um, above 1. And then uh, finally, when we're really ready to go here, um, we get um, both happen at the same time. Percent, um, 
MFI goes above 80 and percent B um, comes above 1. So we, get, we finally get the combination of the, of the two pieces. Here and here, MFI never got to 80, even though we got the nice uh, um, excursions in terms of um, percent B, we didn't really get the, the indicator confirmation. So these were alerts. We needed one more pullback to set the trap to get everything working for people and, and, and really prepare the rally. And then shortly thereafter, you get to participate in this nice piece. Now, everybody I know is sitting there saying, oh, but gee, I wanted to get in here. <laughs> well, that's not what this system is. This is a trend following system, and it waits for the trend to emerge. We'll talk later about how we can try to buy that or try to buy that or try to sell that. That's the characteristics of a reversal system. It, it, it's a matter of psychology. Which do you want to do? Are you contrarian? Do you want to try to pick highs and lows? Um, or do you want to go with the flow? Do you, want to, do you want to participate in the ongoing action? If you want to participate in the ongoing action, then you're going to take out this piece. right? That's, that, that's the piece you're going to go after. Um, and you know what I always say is, think about it this way. We're going to get in late after the, after the low, and we're going, to get in, we're going to get out late after the high. So we're going to give some up here, and we're going to give up some here. What we're looking for is the center cut. The, the, the piece in the middle, that's the, that, that's the piece that we're trying to take out. And our expense of doing that business is, is being late to get in and, and a little bit late to get out. So that's the cost of, of going after this piece of business. You know, the cost of going after this piece of business is boop. And the cost of going after this piece of business is boop. Because you know, when you're trying to buy a low, there can be no certainty that there's not another low in front of you. All right. So each of these pr approaches has a different cost of doing business, and you need to evaluate that cost and see how it fits with your psychology. Is that something that you're comfortable with? So here's the trend following system in Metastock code. We'll skip the, 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 the this just calculates percent B and, and, and the bands. Here's the meat of the system right here percent B greater than 0.8 and MFI, in this case 10 day, greater than 80. Now, one of the most successful tweaks for MFI is to lengthen the MFI periods. Remember that each day it's assigning the value to either the plus column or the minus column. So 10 day MFI can often have just two data points in one column and six or in eight data points in the other column, that may not really be enough to characterize the trading. So I suggest that one of the first tweaks that you experiment with is lengthening the MFI periods. And the number that I like is 14, which by no coincidence is the same number that Wells Wilder originally specified in his work. Um, the time frame doesn't matter here. The, the, the techniques are really applicable um, in, in a, almost any time frame that you deal with. Um, it, what, what's important, and we'll talk about that in the last segment today, is that the, the bars be well formed. If, there, if there's not enough activity within the bars, the system's going to break down. It's not, it's not going to work. So there needs to be enough activity within the bars. That means for some stocks, five-minute bars is about as short as you're going to be able to get. For other stocks, you're not going to be able to get below our bars because there's just not enough activity to form the bars well. So it's going to, it's going to vary, but um, you know, five-minute bars, ten-minute bars, half hours, hours, days, weeks. You know, the old technicians all worked on you know, very long-term charts. Daily charts were their short-term charts. Weekly and monthly charts were the, were the charts they did their major analysis on. And these techniques are really they're, they're transferable up and down the time structure. I, I always use um, daily examples because that's what I trade. But uh, um, you know, if my daily bars, you can just translate to be half-hour bars or 10-minute bars, whatever suits your, <coughs> your own um, approach. So there's the, um, here's the logic. Percent B greater than 0.8 and MFI greater than 80. You just cut and paste this into the long entry portion of a meta stock system. Click on the dollar sign, drops down, 
You get, you know, you get different tabs. One of them will be long entry. This goes in there. This goes in the short entry system. Percent B less than 0.2, MFI less than 20. One neat thing to do is to increase these values, say 0.3 and 30, and then set it up as an alert so that it's tagging almost, so that you start looking at the stocks that are trying to do it. You know? Same thing um, with um, the trade station code, but I've taken advantage of a unique portion, uh, a unique feature of trade station here. Um, they have this alert command. It'll sit over there on the right hand side of the chart and it'll trigger a little alert for you when it happens. Um, I, I don't uh, use that feature myself. I just plot it as an indicator and look at the indicator. I plot it. Um, you can see here um, that um, I've set the signal to be plus one if it's a buy, minus one if it's a sell, and zero otherwise. So it just runs along as a dead flat line at the zero, and then you get a little spike up when it's a buy or a little spike down when it's a sell. That's how I like to look at them. But I put this alert in so you would understand um, um, how to use that feature. Now, with these systems come stops. And um, in relation to this trend following system, I'm going to talk about chandelier stops. When we talk about the reversal systems, I'll talk about parabolic stops. That's an arbitrary assignment. I just put one stop in one section and the other stop in the other. Mix and match them. Feel free. Um, my own preference is for the chandelier stops. I like the internal mechanism of them a little bit better. But there's a tremendous amount of experience out there with the parabolic stops and um, you may be more comfortable with them. So they both work quite well, as you'll see. Chandelier stops were developed by Chuck LeBeau. Um, they are driven by success. Uh, the chandelier, just think of it as a chandelier hanging in a room, you know, off a big chain. That chain is hung off the highest high that has been achieved since you entered the, tr entered the trade. So, and then the stop hangs down from there, and it hangs down by a measure of volatility. You, you can see why this is an intuitively correct stop for me, because I think that the more you incorporate volatility, the, the better picture you're getting of what's really happening. And chandelier stops can be easily adjusted to your trading style. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. They are very malleable. The, the um, parabolic stops are much harder to adjust. Okay, in order to teach you chandelier stops, I have to teach you average true range. Average true range, um, the heart of the chandelier stop is a 10-day exponential average of average true range. Average true range is the true high minus the true low. And the true high is the greater of today's high or yesterday's close. Now, when is that number triggered? When there's a gap. True range is only different from the range when there is a gap. Let's take a look at how this works. Here's a typical bar. We we'll opened here. We'll just say that this is 21, fell to 20, rallied to 22, and came, I mean, rallied to 23 and came back to 22. The next day, we gap down a full point. So the range for the day is here. It's three points. But the true range adds the gap back in. So the true range here is four points. Range of the day, one, two, three points. But overnight, information came into the system. The price formation mechanism kept on churning overnight. And the next day, we opened lower 
and rallied a little bit. So we left this gap, one point gap. So for this day, the true range is four and the actual range is three. Same thing going up. Here we come down. We make a, a low bounce back close here, a point off the bottom. Next day we gap up and then rally. The range of this day is three points. The true range down to the low is four points. If this line were drawn in here, down to here, then the actual range and the true range would be the same value, right? It's only when there's a gap that the true range is different from the range. You just add the gap to the range to get the true range. Are we all comfortable with this idea of true, true range? It's just today's range plus any, any price gap that was created. And the, and the gap is measured from the prior day's close to the high if we went down or to the low if we went up. Okay, how to create a chandelier stop. Calculate the average true range and then this is built into all the software. I just want you to understand what's going on behind it. You will never have to do this calculation. Average true range is built into everything, I think. Or if it's not, they should be beaten severely about the head and shoulders. Um, Calculate the average true range, pick a multiplier, three is the default and I suggest that you start there. Find the highest high since you entered the position if you're long. And the stop equals that highest high minus three times the average true range. So that stop is just, it's, it's hanging there as, you, as the price goes. it's it's, it's hanging underneath the highest high that was recorded. If you pull back, the stop's still attached to the highest high, even though you're coming back. Right? So it never backs off its attachment point. The attachment point is always the highest high that has been achieved since you entered the trade. Likewise, on the downside, you find the lowest low since the entry if you're short, and the stop equals the lowest low plus three times the average true range. So the stop's following you down, attached to the lowest low as you progress lower. And here's what it looks like. An example is worth a thousand words. Here's a squeeze in Donnelly. What came down broke out reversed back in immediately. So remembering our, our methodology from yesterday, in the squeeze, we broke out, so we, sh we took a half position short. We immediately reversed back in. We covered our short and went long a full position and started the chandelier underneath the entry day. All right? Now, this is a chandelier stop that's attached to the highest high. So the next day, the chandelier stop moves from being attached here. Now it's attached up here. Three times the average true range. So, and as we go along, every time we make a new high, the chandelier stop increments up. Now look at this. The stop backed off here. Right? And chandeliers will do this. They'll back off a little bit sometimes, only a little bit, because the average true range increased. All right, that's what happened. That's what, that's what made it happen. We had a couple of real wide days here. So the average true range increased. So even though it's hanging off the same high here, it's, for these four days, it's hanging off the same high. The average true range increased a little bit, so you see it back off, oh, I don't know, it looks like a bit, maybe a sixteenth or so. But then as soon as you start back, get back into gear, it starts incrementing again, rallies into the high. This is the final high. Look, then the chandelier remains attached to that high. Just going sideways, the average true range is dropping here 
That's what's causing that chandelier to increase a little bit here. The average true range is dropping as we get these short bars in replacing these longer bars that we had back here. And then, bango, you're out on this. So it's a very nice trade. And now we have a squeeze entry and a squeeze exit based on the chandelier stop, which is nothing more than the highest high since we entered the trade, minus three times the average true range. My approach on a chandelier stop is that you, you need the close to be lower than the stop for an exit. Um, intraday, um, the way I trade, intraday violations of the stop don't count. A lot of people trade the other way. They say if you break the stop on an intraday basis, they're out immediately because they have a stop in the market. I use closing stops. It's the way I was educated, um, so it's my own natural bias. I have no preference one way or the other. It's just, you know, if, if intraday stops, if you've got stops in the market, are fine. You can actually put, with any decent brokerage firm, you can actually put a stop that says, you know, sell market on close if below such and such. So you can get your brokerage firm to either execute it as a market order if that price is touched during the day or on the close. It's, they'll take both kinds of orders. Okay, here's the opposite case. You come up, you make a consolidation here. Um, you got your three pushes to a high kind of idea going. It's not real clear, but the, the basic thrust of the idea is, is going on here. You get a squeeze, you break down from it, you start the chandelier immediately, and note that this is not a reversal this time. We're going to go with the trend, right? And the chandelier immediately starts to decrement and takes us out here. So we have a very nice piece that we've taken out on our trade. The prior example is a head fake. We we'll come down and reverse back in and start the chandelier against us. This example is a direct entry where we just start the stop. So this is what it would look like if we didn't reverse the short, if we just entered directly. And then it cascades down. Bang -o. Note how note the acceleration here of the stop, really big time acceleration. Why is that? Because you have this huge excursion, intraday excursion down that pulls the stop down dramatically. Right? Even though you didn't close there, it's looking for the lowest low. And that remains the attachment point until over here when it pulls down the stop a little bit more. And then on the fourth day up, you get stopped out. Implementing um, chandelier stops in Metastock. I'm not going to go through the code here. We just uh, we don't have the time, really. But the, the key to this is the use of this PRE variable, PREV variable, the previous variable. It pulls the value of the indicator from the day before. And that's the only way you can keep track of the stop. So it's just all this is doing is saying, let's start with the, the previous value of the indicator, pull it back in, then if we make a new low, adjust the stop, if not, exit. Here's the same idea, but for short. This one was for long entries. This one is for short entries. And then here are the two pieces of code that you use to enter it. If you go back to the, to the, to the code, it says short end entry, formula, shan short. Right? Well, here's that formula. I give you the long formula and the short formula. Um, here's an example of what these uh, um, trend following systems look like in action. This is the trend following system with a chandelier stop. Um, over here, you get an entry. You rally back and get stopped out here. You had a nice little gain. 
Uh, this is your equity line for this system. This is how much money you've made using this system. Um, here you have a short entry stopped out here, a long entry stopped out here, a long entry stopped out here, a short entry stopped out here, and a long entry. And here's the example of your equity curve trading this stock, Hilbro, Gallon, Hamilton, um, during, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten months. Um, the base uh, on this um, was $1,000. So we're up at $1,800, so we gained about 80% on our capital using this system um, in this example for 150 trading days. Here's the uh, um, same idea for um, uh, a stock called Crompton. Here's a, a long entry, and we get stopped out. So here's a, the chandelier at work. We, we entered long here. The trend failed and the chandelier stopped us out here. We enter short here. We get a very nice trade here, a nice rise in the equity, in the equity line. It stopped out, a long entry, again stopped out, and then we get a really nice long entry that carries all the way up and again about the same type of gain in the same period, of about $1,000 to $1,800 in uh, 150 days. So you can see that with the with this um, chandelier stop, we're getting exactly the kind of situation that we want. We're getting larger gains and, and smaller losses. The ratio of our losses is, uh, you know, very good. We're getting a, a fairly large gain to a fairly small loss. And that's the, the key to um, a successful system. It, a trend-following system is going to produce good gains, but when it breaks, um, it's going to be pretty ugly unless you have some type of stop mechanism in here. So our stop mechanism is constraining the losses to relatively small quantities and letting our trend-following gains go. So it, it fits our whole philosophy and approach to the markets. And you can see that on average we're running um, just about 60% uh, um, uh, or so um, winners to losers. But the key here is that we're, our winners are, are running much bigger than our losers.